over 80% of you requested for us to cover Invincible. And ladies and gentlemen, your wish is my command as I present you the full story of Omni-Man. Now with the start of a new series on the channel, please subscribe, like and hit the notification bell. Otherwise, I'll get Omni-Man knocking on your window. <laughs> You don't want that, do you? Omni-Man might just be the greatest hero Earth has ever known. However, throughout the first season, we witnessed his turn to the dark side as he took out the Guardians of the Globe. It wasn't even close, baby. He destroyed them. No! No! Holy s***! He dead! Omni-Man gave his son the beating of a lifetime before dropping one of the most iconic memes of the last decade. Think, Mark! But then he vanished, flying away into space, leaving us without closure as he came to terms with his own emotions. However, that leaves us with so many questions. Why did Omni-Man have a change of heart? Where was he flying off to? And what does this all mean for the people of Earth, especially Mark? To answer all of this and to understand just how crazy things are going to get. And trust me, he gets wed, he married, he married a bug and has a bug kid. Look at him. How did he even have the, you know, the, how did he do the deed with that? Are you going to risk your life for that? She's I think bad, some of though. you would. You know, bad. <laughs> Anyway, now that Omni-Man has betrayed both Earth and his own people, we are going to need to look well before he pretends to be Earth's greatest hero. Long before he was Omni-Man, he was just Nolan, an alien from Viltrum, where strength meant everything and the weak were crushed. Under the command of their leader, Argyll, the Viltrumites raided and conquered every planet they could find. This was light work for them as they got super speed, flight, near invulnerability. However, what might be their most underrated abilities are their de-accelerated aging allowing Viltrumites to live for thousands of years. Combined with their dominant genes which basically let them breed with almost any other race and produce an hair that is 99% Viltrumite even if they look like this. This means that Nolan and other Viltrumites are strong enough to conquer another planet and then the ones who conquer that planet will outlive the surviving generations until no one on that planet even remembers life before the Viltrumites. It will be like aliens taking over Earth during the times of ancient Greece and we're still in control right now in the modern day. The only threat to Viltrumites is other Viltrumites but that doesn't exactly mean they are safe. Viltrumites love battle and fighting just like Saiyans from Dragon Ball. As a result, their rule of law was survival of the strongest and the elimination of the weak. If two Viltrumites fought, the loser would be killed on the spot. If a Viltrumite broke the law or committed treason, they'd be beaten down and allowed time to recover to get back up again just to be killed once they are back to their strongest state. And even when we look at reproduction and finding a life partner or love, it was very much normal for anyone to choose their mate by overpowering them, making them worthy of your seed. For example, Mark was overpowered by a Anissa. And in Viltrumite culture, that meant she was allowed to get pregnant by him. I know that sounds bad. All of this sums up the world Nolan was born into and the world he lived within for thousands of years before the start of the story. Nolan was bred to believe that Viltrumites are the strongest, so they deserve to rule the universe. That is their law. Might is right and might alone. Without strength, we have nothing. However, whilst most Viltrumites love this brutal and savage lifestyle, there was one who felt that the spread of the Viltrumite Empire needed to be stopped for the sake of the universe. 
that is. So he killed Emperor Argyll and plunged the planet into a civil war, which left only the strongest Viltrumites alive under their new ruler, Thry, a dude with an even bigger fetish for conquering planets than Argyll ever did. As a young man, Nolan would sign up to become a planet conqueror under him. He became so renowned that Nolan was even given command of his own unit, proving he was one of Vitrum's most passionate supporters. However, a new civil war broke out between the Viltrumites, of which only 37 remained, and a new path forward was a necessity, especially since there was a virus going around massacring all of their race from the inside. They couldn't cure it. In the end, they looked off planet for a solution. So like a macho mustachioed man of steel, Nolan was sent to Earth with the mission of infiltrating their society and breaking their resistance to ready them for a Viltrumite takeover. In issue 50, we see Nolan shortly after he arrived on Earth and he quickly crossed paths with Cecil, the leader of the Global Defense Agency, and explained that he was here to help the people of Earth, aiming to spread peace across the universe. Yeah. Peace, right? And that his goal was to protect the people of Earth. This is a load of Barnacles. Despite knowing that Nolan was lying out of his ass, Cecil still opted to work with him and offered to teach him about human culture so that he could adapt more naturally. Let's be real, what's he gonna do? Defy this godlike yeah. being and die? Think, Mark! Nolan adopted the last name Grayson and posed as an author whilst also acting as Earth's mightiest new superhero. As Omni-Man, he was a greater hero than anyone else by a huge mile. And whilst he would primarily work alone or with Cecil, he would also occasionally work with the Guardians of the Globe, a team of Earth's mightiest heroes. Despite his cooperation with them, Nolan always kept them more or less at arm's length and refused to directly join them. Because even though Nolan was living on Earth, he never really got too close with anyone except his costume maker, Art Rosenbaum. Your dad's never mentioned me, has he? However, everything changed when he saved Debbie, who he would eventually marry and have a child named Mark. And so, for about a decade and a half, Nolan would live out this charade as Earth's greatest savior and the classic family man while secretly waiting for the day he would conquer the planet and hand it to the Viltrum Empire. The catalyst to this being his son's powers awakening, where they would work together to take over Earth and have, you know, a real father-son bonding moment. Casually, you know, I just have to kill 10 billion people, take over the planet, uprule countries and governments. It's not that really big of a deal now, is it? <laughs> Now, jokes aside, this is where the show and the comics differ pretty heavily. This is because of the different goals and themes between each medium, the structure and presentation of early events happening at very different times. Most notably, in the animated series in the first episode, it follows Mark as his powers awaken. And then we see Nolan killing the Guardians of the Globe, leaving huh? us this uneasy knowledge throughout the first season where we are aware of Nolan being this murderous monster and are unsure about it if he was even in control of himself the entire time. By setting Nolan up in this morally ambiguous light where he is both the world's greatest hero and this secret killer, it puts a question on our mind that extends to the other characters we meet. For example, the Mauler twins are evil, but we see the hero, robot, working with them to make his new body. Cecil hires the villain, D.A. Sinclair, to work for the government. Rex and Duplicate both cheat on their partners. The villain Titan is shown caring deeply about his family and community. Almost every character is presented in this grey light throughout the season. And Nolan is presented as the tree that everything else branches out from. Now in the comics, we see all of these events happening as well. However, Nolan's attack on the Guardians of the Globe 
Rogue doesn't happen until much, much later. Instead, we follow him as someone who seems to be an ideal superhero that isn't jaded by knowing he kills all of his friends. Yeah! <laughs> Another notable difference in how Omni-Man is portrayed is his encounter with the Flaxons. In the comics, Omni-Man is taken prisoner, his powers are negated, and after 8 months, he manages to escape and lead a revolution. It's a story that makes him feel vulnerable, charismatic enough to lead others, and strong enough to fight off a whole planet. But in the show, he isn't captured at all, but instead dives into the portal of Flaxons, opponents who are already retreating by the way, he's never a prisoner and he even gives the Flaxons a speech about how Earth isn't theirs to conquer before, you know, casually ripping their leader's skull out as he dives through the cities and destroys everything. He then forces them to open a portal back home for him and then drops a mountain on the remaining survivors as he leaves their world behind. The Omni-Man of the show is meant to be terrifying and this is a hint at what what Earth resisting him might look like, let alone all the Viltrumites together. Regardless of which version we are looking at though, Nolan is visibly distressed and when he finds out Mark got his powers, he goes from this carefree dude to someone on edge. While training with Mark, he accidentally hits him way too hard. He snaps at Debbie, which we find out is very uncharacteristic of him, and he even states that he wonders if life would have been more simple if Mark never developed his powers at all. These are both the first glimpses of Nolan showing that he is more than meets the eye, but also that he is conflicted in some way. And all of this kind of comes to a head with the revival of the immortal. As the name suggests, the former leader of the Guardians of the Globe was, um, well, Immortal. Once his body was reassembled, he goes on a rampage and tries to kill Nolan to avenge his lost comrades. And whilst he puts up a better fight than almost anyone else would, he ends up being crushed under Nolan's brute strength yet again. Something that Mark is a witness to this time round. And this is the moment, ladies and gentlemen, when Nolan is forced to tell the truth, explaining to Mark that he was not from some peacekeeping world, but instead that he came here to prepare Earth to be conquered. That Mark was even meant to help him on this mission so that together, these two Viltrumites would destroy anyone foolish enough to oppose them. However, now there is a slight problem. Even though Mark is almost entirely Viltrumite DNA by 99%, he was not raised on Viltrum like Nolan. He is a product of his environment and has known Earth's culture and loves humans. He wasn't brought up on the culture of violence and he wasn't taught to kill the weak. And the only Viltrumite influence he did have is his father, someone who always taught him to help others and showed him nothing but love, as shown from the flashback of the baseball scenes, right? That was really cute. Even touch my heart. So this causes a huge dilemma. Viltrumites are supposed to be savages, but Mark brings that into question. If all of them are supposed to even be like this, then why is Mark this upstanding solid dude and isn't? Suddenly, we have this discussion of nature versus nurture. And if that's the case, then there might be more to Nolan as well, right? Mark, of course, rejects his father here and opts to protect humanity and the earth. And this is confusing as hell to Nolan and he goes into full crisis mode red alert. Because to Nolan, Mark is now standing in his way and he needs to be eliminated. But more importantly, because of the world Nolan grew up in, defeating Mark is the same as winning him over. Might is right. Showing Mark how much stronger he is than him should guarantee that he would join him right? So he proceeds to whoop his ass to the point of oh, near death. So it was brutal to watch this in season one. I went nuts. Bruh, this 
was crazy seeing this on screen. So, in the end, even turning hundreds of innocent people into collateral to show Mark that these insects don't matter to the mighty Vultramite who outlived them by millennia. A swing of Nolan's hand could even clear dozens of them, kill them with no effort. Where Vultramites live for thousands of years, humanity barely makes it to 100. Human lives are, or at least should be, inconsequential. Nolan tells Mark that everything he has felt on this planet has been a facade and he didn't care about anyone here because even if he did, their lives would pass by in a blink of an eye to him. He even states that he sees Debbie. Mark's mother as more akin to a pet than to an actual wife. After all, Nolan had only been on Earth for a few decades. In the scope of his life, that's nothing. He's been living for thousands. However, as I mentioned Immortal earlier, and like Nolan, he lives for an impossibly long time. However, unlike Nolan, the Immortal was interested in the rest of humanity, and that only caused him pain as he watched those he loves die over and over again. So between Omni-Man and the Immortal, we have these two parallel views on what it really means to live forever. Omni-Man feels a sense of superiority and the immortal deals with the trauma that comes from it. When Nolan looks at humanity coldly, suggesting that Mark do the same, he is protecting himself and his son from feeling the way the immortal does. You can't feel lost if you don't allow yourself to get attached. In a twisted way, Omni-Man is protecting his son, the only way he knows, through strength and being brutal. Mark is is only 20 years old. He hasn't had to come face to face with these feelings of loss yet. And because of that, he refuses to listen to what his father is saying. And faced with the frustration of Mark not understanding the gravity of his decision here, we have the birth of a legendary me. Editor, please play the clip. Think, Mark, think! What Nolan was trying to do here was to show his son Mark that there is no point in resisting. After all, he is just one Viltrumite and there are still dozens more ready to invade Earth. If Mark can't even stop his father Omni-Man, what hope is there? So with one final effort, Nolan tells his son to think and asks what will be left of this world he loves in 500 years when everyone he knows and cherishes has long since passed away. And Mark tells him that after everything else has faded, he still has his father. The subtext being that he understands that the losses he will experience are going to hurt. But as long as his dad is still there with him, he will be okay. And this is when Nolan breaks. The alien who knew nothing about love or compassion stops for a moment and realizes that he was trying so hard to convince his son to join him because he does care about him. He loves his son Mark. He had been stating he could just have another son. After all, what's another 20 years to someone who lives a millennia? But in the moment that Mark states he will still have his father, Nolan feels something he has never allowed himself to experience before. But if if he is feeling love for Mark, then what does that mean for his mission? The whole time Nolan was on Earth, he kept everyone at arm's length. Not because he is incapable of caring, but because he couldn't allow himself to. However, his time on Earth had changed him. He was upset when Mark got his powers because he knew that it meant the end of his life here. He would have to kill his friends and the Guardians of the Globe. He would have to leave his wife behind. He would never be able to talk to Art again. And everything that he presumed he felt had to be questioned. And so, with his son broken before him and still refusing to join the cause of the Viltrumites, Nolan pulls his fist back to kill him, but he can't go through with it. And instead, he flies off into space with tears flowing down his face in a very, you got a grown man like me crying, I'm so serious. But Nolan was a traitor to Viltrum by making this decision, leaving his post and allowing Earth to put up a resistance. But more importantly, 
importantly, he had shown the other side of himself to the planet. His speech to Mark had been transmitted to the entire world. Debbie had heard him say she meant nothing. Thousands were dead because of him. And most importantly, he had attacked his son like some kind of monster. In the end, Nolan was a man stuck between two worlds. But because of his actions, he would no longer be accepted in either of them. And so, he ran away from his problems. Now, Harrison will explain the next arc which season 2 will cover and what exactly happened to Omni-Man with him having a second son. As Adil said, because he abandoned his duty of conquering Earth, Nolan was gonna get his ass thrown into jail. So to get a lighter sentence, he decided to conquer another planet and offer it to the Viltramites, which ends up being Thraxa, a world inhabited by bug people with a 9 month lifespan. The laws of this planet state that the oldest and wisest member of their society be made into a monarch. And as the oldest bug person isn't even a year old yet, Nolan is instantly made king. And his first decree as ruler, I hear you ask? Well, of course, it is to get some bugussy. Disgusting! He meets a Thraxan woman named Andressa, and Andressa he did. The two very quickly have a child together, which looks mostly human, or Viltramite, I guess. Except there is one notable detail I'm sure you've all seen. He's got purple skin. Okay, it's time for one of our favorite games on the show called What If It Was Purple? However, he ages incredibly quickly at first, like his mother, and by adolescence, he ages much more more like his father does. Outside of that, whilst he isn't as strong as a real Viltramite, he will grow to be about as strong as Mark over time. Also, because the bug people have such short lifespans and need to be focused on quick education, they have photographic memories, which more or less makes this kid a prodigy by Earth standards. Having spent some time on this planet and being able to really think about what happened on Earth, Nolan eventually reaches out to Mark by sending one of his bug people to bring him to Thraxa. Now, talking to Mark has two big purposes here. Firstly, he wants to discuss what happened and try to make amends. Nolan by no means expects his son's forgiveness and is more than understanding of his hesitance. He also explains that he can't go back to Earth after what happened. Nolan acknowledges that his time on Earth had changed him. He explains that on Viltrum, his new child would have been executed for having purple skin as it would have been seen as a deformity and a sign of weakness. But having learned that he is capable of caring for others and seeing that he can love, Nolan wants his new son to survive. And that leads us into the second reason Nolan called for Mark. The Viltramites know that he's betrayed them and they are not as forgiving as he would have hoped despite the prospect of this other planet. In fact, three Viltramites are being sent to Thraxa right now and Nolan wants Mark to help him protect his new home and family from the invaders. But they fail miserably with Nolan being sentenced to death. However, the laws of Viltrum insist that he isn't healthy or capable enough of defending himself. Because of this, Nolan is taken prisoner whilst his body heals, postponing his execution. As he is taken away though, he tells his son to read his books, as that is where he will find the answers. For Mark's part, the Viltrumites beat him down even worse than his dad did on Earth. But there are less than 40 Viltrumites alive right now, so killing one of their people who hasn't broken their laws would be foolish. Because of this, Mark is left alive in hopes of being won over in the future. Once he recovered, Mark would take his new brother with him back to Earth to be raised by his mother, where he'd later be given the name Oliver. Now, the books Nolan wrote were focused on sci-fi adventures, more specifically, his own sci-fi adventures. Inside were details of all the things Nolan had come across across his lifetime which were capable of harming Viltramites. So now, if not conquering Earth marked him as a traitor, offering up the secret weaknesses of his people is basically high treason. But more importantly, it was an indication that Nolan really was serious about changing and wanting to put his family before Viltrum. He just wasn't ready to accept these inner feelings just yet. This idea of how much his family really means is doubled down on in issue 45, as Nolan sits in prison. While healing, he shared
instead a cell with this melty fish looking alien dude who points out that Nolan seems pretty troubled lately. At first Nolan says that the reason is that he's nearly healed and so his execution is getting closer by the day, but his cellmate says he's always known he was going to be executed and this never really bothered him before. Rather, it is obvious that there is something new troubling him. Hearing this, Nolan takes a moment to think to himself about what it might be and ultimately realizes that he misses his wife. Again, this is the dude who when fighting Mark said that Debbie meant nothing to him and was more like a pet than a real partner. However, now that he'd been freed of the pressure and expectation of the Viltrumite way of life, he could actually think about what mattered to him and this acts as another step towards his self-actualization and towards him understanding just how much Earth really had changed him. Now whilst in prison, Nolan speaks telepathically with Alan the Alien, a member of the Coalition of Planets who was a friend of Mark's. In issue 55, Alan tells him about what's been happening with Mark and the role he is playing in the conflict between the Coalition and Viltrum. He also says that he's allowed himself to be captured to help Nolan escape in hopes that he will help in the fight too. The topic soon changed though as Alan starts telling Nolan about his relationship with the freaky tentacle lady and how his people oppose their union. As TMI as this may sound, something strange happens. Nolan actually empathizes and opens up about Debbie and how the feelings he has for her go against everything he believed in. He says, My entire existence has been put into question. I feel a love I've never felt before, made stronger by absence, and it's something, as a Viltrumite, I should not be feeling. This idea epitomizes how much Nolan is really starting to change and proving to us that he isn't just putting on a show. In fact, over time, he and Alan actually become friends, something Nolan actively avoided having on Earth as much as possible. But here, as Nolan is slowly freeing himself with the misguided ways of Viltrum, he welcomes this new friend into his life. Once Nolan is back to full strength and ready to be executed, Alan launches his prison break. He frees as many prisoners as possible to cause a distraction and punches a hole through the ship for him and Nolan to escape through. Once outside though, they have to fight off a Viltrumite and together they accidentally make his head explode. God, Bob, that's brutal. Nolan tells Alan that they shouldn't need to worry about being chased because there are so few Viltrumites left that they can't afford to send anyone after them, which leads us into the plans of the Viltrumites going forward. Nolan believes that now that they've seen Mark and how he is effectively a perfect Viltrumite offspring, the next step for Viltrum will be to conquer Earth and turn it into a breeding camp to bolster their numbers due to humanity's compatibility with them. And depending on how freaky they feel like getting, in a matter of just two decades, they could exponentially expand their forces, leaving no one in the universe capable of opposing them. To that end, Nolan follows Alan to the Coalition of Planets homeworld, Telescria, where they meet with the leader, Theodos. And if that name sounds familiar, that's because he was the Viltrumite who betrayed and killed the former Emperor of Viltrum, Argal. Together, Alan and Nolan go out in search of all the threats to Viltrum that were listed in Nolan's books. This includes a motorcycle riding mercenary called Space Racer who has a gun that can kill Viltrumites, dinosaur like monsters called Ragnars, Klaxus plants, and gathering a few extra allies to reinforce them. But even with these new weapons in hand, Nolan expresses that he feels unprepared for the upcoming war. Which brings us back to Theodos, who reveals that he didn't just kill Argyle, he also was the one who created the Scourge virus that wiped out most of the Viltrumites. Not only that though, he also perfected an even stronger version and if the Coalition lose the war, he will not hesitate to use it to cause a Viltrumite genocide once again. Nolan and Alan return to Earth for Mark, but upon doing so, they cross paths with Debbie. Nolan apologizes, saying that he meant nothing that he said before and that his time on Earth had changed him. Of course, Debbie says that she doesn't believe him and a very sad Nolan tells her that he understood. It's this very solemn moment of him accepting her hatred as atonement for what he has done, and it's part of Nolan's character that I really appreciate. If nothing else, he is at least accountable for his actions. He doesn't try to force her to understand or forgive him, he says what he needs to say and when she doesn't go for it, he just understands. As much as he would love a second chance, he recognises that he doesn't deserve one and it's gonna hurt but that's okay. Nolan also takes a moment to reunite with Oliver, who because of his bug DNA now looks like he's about 14 or 15 years old, and Nolan takes genuine interest in his son, asking him to tell him all about his life since leaving Thraxa. 
Oliver struggles to express himself though, and so Nolan suggests that perhaps he should come with them to the war so that they can have some time to bond during the flight. Everything was now beginning to change for Omni-Man. The life he told himself was a lie with Mark, he was now embracing with Oliver. He no longer needed to fake it anymore, and there's this very real softness to him that was not there when the story first started. But with that, he finally gets some quality time with his sons as they fly to Telescria and prepare for war. However, before they make it, they're attacked by a group of three Viltrumites. Lucan, who invaded Thraxa, Conquest, who invaded Earth, and this other guy who doesn't even have a name. Now this fight gets brutal very fast, with Oliver quickly running out of breath, forcing him onto a nearby planet for air. Nolan manages to reach and protect him, but by the time they catch it to Mark, they find that he has killed Conquest, at the expense of being disemboweled. Because of this, the mission is put on hold, as Alan returns to Telescria, whilst Oliver and Nolan stay behind to tend to Mark. And they are here for a while. Several months, in fact. And this acts as a way for Nolan and Oliver to to finally get to know each other properly. This is super interesting because Oliver very much has a Viltrumite perspective on the world. Due to his Thraxan upbringing and seeing his entire culture destroyed or aged to death by the time he would be a toddler, Oliver has a fairly cold view on life and death. His people don't view it as something to fear like humans do, but rather something to embrace. Up until now in the story, it had been Mark who was trying to correct his path but he'd seen very little success in convincing Oliver to be a bit more empathetic with those around him. However, Nolan grew up on Viltrum with a fairly similar mindset for thousands of years, and only now was he realising that he should care about those around him. Because of this common starting point, Nolan was able to reach Oliver in a way that Mark never could. But once Mark finally recovers and grows a sick-ass beard, the three of them head back to Telescria and find the war has already begun. At first, First, it looks like the coalition is on the back foot, but with the addition of Mark, Oliver and Nolan, the tide of battle changes almost immediately. Nolan saves Theodos whilst Mark and Oliver manage to destroy the Viltrumite battleship. This forces Emperor Thrag to call for retreat back to their home planet. In spite of this, the coalition take the battle to Viltrum to strike whilst the iron's hot. However, they're ambushed. It's here that the war reached its most dramatic stage. Whilst everyone has their hands full on the battlefield, there was one man who stood out amongst the carnage. Thrag. He is an absolute beast, literally punching off Oliver's jaw and pulling off his arm. It all proves to be for nothing however, as together with Mark and Theodus, Nolan drives through Viltrum and causes the entire planet to explode. This sets Thrag off on a rampage, killing Theodus instantaneously, leaving it up to Nolan to hold him off, giving us a better look at where his rationale is. As in issue 76, he tells Thrag that he feels their people deserve nothing less than ex extinction for what they've done. Mark joins the fight shortly after tending to Oliver, but soon realises that they are face to face with an enemy they cannot defeat. Thrag is completely insurmountable, and accepting their defeat, Nolan asks his son to please know that no matter what he said, he always loved him. Which isn't just lip service, as Nolan dives in front of a fatal blow on Mark by the hands of Thrag, taking all the damage himself. Despite this, as Thrag goes into crush Mark's skull between his hands, he pauses. General Clegg declares that unloyal Viltrumites such as them deserve to die, but because they are so short on numbers, Thrag spares their lives, saying that if Viltrum is to survive, they need all the Viltrumites they can get. These two in particular, as they're a special case and must be preserved above all others. Which, like, eh? I kinda get letting Mark live, but Nolan's plot armour just proves that it has no bounds, as he is nothing more than just a straight up traitor. Like Mark at least has Earth's trust on his side to keep him alive. Regardless, the Viltrumites abandon Mark, Oliver and Nolan in space, where they are eventually rescued by the Coalition, signalling the complete disappearance of all remaining Viltrumites under Thrag's command. Happy days, right? Well… Mark quickly realises that their only destination 
location that they possibly could have gone to is Earth. He even thinks up the worst case scenarios, like his friends and family dying as humanity is completely wiped out. Thus, Mark and Nolan make their way back immediately. On the flight, Nolan once again has some time to come to terms with the changes he's experiencing. He begins worrying about Oliver, Mark, and Debbie as he starts questioning if these emotions were always present and had just been buried. It's a sad moment where he's trying to open up to his son, but Mark is too preoccupied to even listen to what Nolan has to say. At first, it seems like the Viltrumites aren't anywhere to be seen, but Thrag appears behind them and says that they are very much there. He explains that the Viltrumites have already spread all across the planet and assumed roles in human society. They will perfectly blend in and breed with humans until the Viltrumite race has been restored. And in exchange for allowing them to live there, the Viltrumites will not interfere with Earth in any way. They won't attack anything and they won't help anything. They will just exist on the planet. Mark is opposed to this, but Thrag says that if they refuse, then he will have his people destroy Earth in the same way Mark and Nolan destroyed Viltrum. They are at an impasse, so they might as well both benefit from peace in the meantime. Ultimately, both Nolan and Mark agree to these terms. Nolan takes the opportunity to try and meet with Debbie one more time and finds her as she's breaking up with her new boyfriend, Paul. And in this moment where he finds out that she had another partner while he was gone, Nolan isn't mad. He's not upset and instead, he's just hurt. He recognizes that he essentially did the same, but this is the first time he's coming to terms with the emotions associated with that kind of a decision. The Nolan from Viltrum didn't care who his partner was. He didn't care about loyalty to a spouse and he definitely wouldn't care if his wife slept with other people beyond maybe the idea of his property being taken by someone else. But current Nolan is different. He recognizes that she isn't just property or a pet. She is someone he loves and doesn't want to lose. And now he understands everything that goes into the jealousy and hurt that can come with a feeling as powerful as love. But even in dealing with these new emotions, Nolan doesn't get angry. He just accepts things as they are maturely and moves on with it. Nolan talks about how he wishes that Debbie could know how much he missed her and she very fairly says she will never forgive him. Him. He tries to rationalize it by explaining about the world he grew up in and how it emotionally stunted him, but she just tells him he ruined her life and says she wishes things could go back to how they were. And here, Nolan pulls Debbie in, holds her close, and says things will never go back to how they were because he will never lie to her again. Nolan, in his reunion with his wife, is never assumptive. He never tries to force her to feel one way or another, and he completely takes accountability for his actions. While many of the things he had been indoctrinated with on Viltrum are slowly eroding, there is one core value that he holds on to through the rest of the series, his sense of responsibility and duty. Nolan doesn't try to make excuses, and when a situation arises that places responsibility on his shoulders, he embraces it and fulfills his obligations to the best of his ability. And in this case, that means telling Debbie he was wrong, saying he's sorry and action promising to do better without ever casting the blame on anyone else. And this is the same sense of duty that inspires Mark to do what he believes is right regardless. Ironically, making what might be one of Nolan's greatest strengths leading to Mark's greatest flaw as a character. Although Nolan was mostly reformed at this point, the people of Earth still were less than stoked to have him around given the whole killing thousands of people thing, you know? And so he and Debbie make the decision to go and live in Telescria instead. Huh? Um, so the entire flight there, they're making up for lost time by going to the bone zone. Like it's to the point where the crew of the ship needs to wear blindfolds anywhere that they might cross paths with them. But eventually they make it to Telescria and they're finally reunited with Oliver. He's got a new arm and jaw and he's doing pretty well. However, he's still stuck on the Earth's mentality of having superheroes clean up the streets. Nolan tells him he tried to do the same thing when he first arrived, but it's completely unnecessary 
necessary on Telescaria and rather than fighting crime, they can focus on actually having a life. They aren't the only ones living here though, as this is also home to Alan the Alien, who, after the death of Thetis, has assumed the role of leader of the Coalition. Unfortunately, this means he's placed in a pretty difficult position. He's being presumed by the other members of the Coalition to find and eliminate Thrag and the Viltrumites who had escaped. So Alan tells Nolan that he is planning to spread the updated Scourge virus on Earth to kill all the Viltrumites hiding there, but because humans and Viltrumites have such similar DNA, he will be putting the entire population at risk. When the virus is mentioned, Nolan immediately rips through one of the walls and finds that the virus isn't being hidden where Thaddeus had kept it. And here, we have a bit of a role reversal from Nolan, very much taking up Mark's position from season 1. Back then, Nolan was arguing that by subduing and conquering the planet, they could save millions of lives. However, at this moment, Alan is saying he will release the virus on Earth to save the rest of the universe while Nolan sees how horrifying the idea of doing anything for the greater good can be. It is now Alan who is trying to make a brutal decision for the greater good of the universe and Nolan who is arguing that the lives on Earth are precious and should not be snuffed out in a conflict that doesn't even concern them. The fight continues into space and it is just a direct parallel to Nolan's fight with Mark in season 1. But this time, Nolan is on the receiving end of the beating. Alan goes into this whole speech about how naive Nolan is and tells tells him he has to recognize what needs to be done, or in Nolan's language, think, Mark, think. This beatdown lasts until Oliver joins in to protect his father. Alan doesn't want to fight Oliver, who is still more or less just a teenager, and so he allows him to knock him around until a coalition army surrounds them and forces them to talk. But something unexpected happens as Oliver hears Alan out. He agrees with him. Oliver is much more like his father used to be. He isn't bothered by moral dilemmas. He doesn't feel anything for the people of Earth. To him, all that matters is that they can eliminate every evil Viltrumite all at once and humanity might just end up a casualty of the path towards peace. Nolan pushes back, suggesting that he isn't an anomaly and that he believes that when Viltrumites spend time on Earth, like he had, they will quickly begin to find the same new perspective that he did. And this change in perspective is of course that might is not always is right and that just because they have the power to crush others doesn't mean they have the right to. Where emotions like love are not signs of weakness but they are instead wonderful parts of life the Viltrumite people have shut themselves off of. And so Alan asks him two important questions. First, what if he's wrong? And second, is he trying to save the innocent people of Earth or his fellow Viltrumites? Oliver adds to this, saying the people of Earth are assholes who wage war against themselves and if if Viltrumites are going to learn anything from humanity, they will learn how to be even worse. Alan orders that Nolan be captured, but he fights back, at one point even grabbing Oliver by the neck and getting ready to punch him before realizing he was about to make the same mistake he had done with Mark. Ultimately, Nolan loses the fight against Alan and Oliver, and they set off to Earth to release the virus, leaving him to fall back to Telescria, where Nolan is met by his wife telling her of Alan's plan, so they need to head to Earth to warn Mark. However, they never get a chance, as Nolan is arrested moments later. Releasing the Scourge virus does not go as planned, and only Mark is infected, leaving Alan completely shocked at himself for what he was trying to do. When he returns to Telescria, he apologizes to Nolan, saying that the pressure of running the coalition was greater than he had anticipated and it led him to making his greatest mistake ever, becoming best friends again. Oliver also apologizes to his father and Alan asks Nolan to not hold it against the kid. But Nolan responds by saying he's proud to see that both of his sons stand up for their belief, even if that means they will butt heads every now and then. Alan tells Nolan that just because he isn't trying to exterminate the Viltrumites with a virus doesn't mean that he trusts them. And so he he sends Nolan on a mission to Earth with Debbie, much to the dismay of their ship's crew who will need to listen to weeks of bedroom rodeo on the journey back. And when they arrive, Nolan gets quite the shock as he learns that Mark had just been killed by a giant science dinosaur. Okay, this is a lot to get into, which we will save for another video, but the short version is that it was just a clone of him and the real Mark is fine. I do wish that this moment was like sat on for a little bit more than a few panels because Nolan dealing 
playing with the thought of Mark dying could have been a very interesting arc to explore. But things settle down once Mark is shown to be alive and Nolan and Debbie decide to stay on Earth once again. Well, kind of, because Cecil tells them that while he personally can overlook everything Nolan has done, he doesn't believe the people of Earth will be able to do the same and so they will have to live on the moon. This is honestly like more for show than any real form of punishment as they can just fly or teleport back to Earth almost instantaneously. The bigger reason for this though is so that wow. Nolan can keep an eye on the other Viltrumites who are living on the moon and keep Cecil up to date if they plan to do anything. Luckily, Nolan wouldn't have to wait long as only few seconds after Cecil left, he was attacked by Thrag. As it turns out, when Viltrumites were working on healing Mark from the virus, it was discovered that he was the grandson of Argyll, the true emperor of Viltrum who had been killed by Thetis. This means the rightful ruler of the Viltrumites should be Nolan and not Thrag. Nolan isn't exactly interested in being emperor of the Viltrumites, but Thrag feels the need to eliminate him all the same, saying that if anyone else finds out the truth, then his position in power could be put into question. And as strong as Nolan is, he's quite literally nothing compared to Thrag. He beats him within an inch of his life, even punching the side of his head so hard that his eye pops out. As Thrag goes in for the killing blow, he tells Nolan that all his bloodline has earned him is death. But as he winds back for the punch, his arm is grabbed and a group of Viltrumites who had overheard what he had said attack him for trying to kill the heir to Argyll. And this time, it is Nolan who spares Thrag, telling the other Viltrumites to let him live. What? And as Nolan works his way to his feet, all of the other Viltrumites bow before him as a new emperor has been found. Nolan's first decree as emperor is that he wants to change the Viltrumites' way of life and bring a new dawn for the empire. Not all believe in Nolan though, as Thrag tells them that their people will never follow him. He says that if Nolan doesn't kill him now, then he will one day take his sweet revenge. But Nolan, like an idiot, just brushes it off. Donut, you're so stupid. You're so stupid, you're stupid. So what is the best way to force Thrag to watch the Viltrumites change? Well, by sending them into exile. This is mainly to show his people that Nolan is serious about spreading message of kindness and leaving behind the ways of the past. However, it does come at the expense of leaving arguably the strongest man in the universe alive to hunt him down and try and get revenge. This dude is stupid. <laughs> Has he not read any manga or comic books? You never leave the baddest guy alive. And Alan is with me here, because he's very quick to question Nolan about his decision, but again, Nolan doubles down and says this is the path forward for the Viltrumite people. However, when Debbie then asks him if he is sure about what he's doing, Nolan is much more honest. He tells her that he isn't confident, but he knows that killing Thrag feels antithetical to anything he's trying to build and the chance to convince his people to do good outweighs any damage that Thrag can do alone. And building a better world will be even more important going forward as Mark reveals that he's having a baby with Eve. He asks his father if he felt scared that he might screw things up when he found out he was having a child. And Nolan says that the only concern he had was if Mark would be strong enough to help him conquer the planet. However, once he learned what it meant to love, things began to change. And since that change, he has been scared every single day. So he assures Mark that he will be scared in the same way. Following this is a family dinner on the moon with Eve, Mark, Nolan, and Debbie. Majority of it is spent with Nolan trying to convince Eve that he has changed, saying he would never try anything like he had in the past again. And Mark steps up to say that if he did, he would just kick Nolan's butt anyways, which escalates the situation even further in the the most civil way possible. An epic arm wrestle battle between father and son capped by Nolan slamming Mark's arm through the table to just to show him that he is still the top dog here. Even so, things in the family have finally settled down and found peace. And speaking of peace, Robot kills Cecil and takes over the Global Defense Agency, essentially taking an all out any means to justify peace route. To achieve this, he eliminates anyone and everyone who opposes his vision. While Mark is super 
super against this idea based on the methods being used, Robot talks to Nolan and expresses that he will allow the Viltrumites to go unaffected and unharmed if they stand down. Basically, the Viltrumite goal right now is to reproduce on Earth until their species isn't at the risk of being extinct. If they were to try and fight against Robot, then many of their remaining survivors would be wiped out. So this is the only safe path forward for his people and as such, Nolan agrees. Also, it doesn't hurt that while Robot is cold and calculated, he is bringing about an entirely peaceful world. Things improve rapidly, villains begin working for the betterment of society, heroes are more organized than ever, and every sense of the word, the world is peaceful, even if it is being run from the shadows by Robot. Maybe it's the way Nolan was raised, but he's able to look beyond the terrible things Robot was doing and sees the value of the change being made here. This, in combination with the promise of his people's safety, are ultimately what leads Nolan to choosing to side with Robot rather than Mark. Mark is so disgusted by the actions of Robot and his father that he makes the decision to take Eve and their newly born daughter and leaves the planet, opting to live in Telescria instead. At this point, Nolan is at an interesting crossroad. On one hand, he has left his old life behind him and is embracing the more human perspective as he has learned from Debbie and Mark. But on the other hand, as the new emperor of the Viltrumites, he needs to make decisions that will better the lives of his people more so than make the choice he wants to make. Again, we are seeing this responsibility first side of Nolan here, and as a result, he is falling more in line with how we see Alan after becoming the leader of the coalition. Some of his relationships, mainly with his son Mark, will be stressed by the choices he needs to make, but Nolan does need to make them all the same. The story then follows Mark and Eve as they start their new life in Telescria for a bit, and while we don't see much about Nolan, we do get a different look at his character altogether. That's because in issue 124, there is a reboot. Well, cause, uh, sort of. Mark gets sent back to the past with all of his current memories by some weird tentacle monster in a cave, and things go very differently. With the knowledge of the future, Mark is able to make things better pretty quickly. He anticipates villain attacks, he stops disasters before they ever happen, and of course, he knows the truth about Nolan. At first, Mark keeps his powers a secret from his dad this time, so that Nolan wouldn't have to change. However, Nolan eventually finds out and asks why he wouldn't tell him right away. Rather than answering him, Mark asks his father if he loves him, something that catches Nolan way off guard. Mark says that he needs him to really think it over and only answer honestly. Then asking again, after some thought, Nolan responds, yes I do. I truly love your mother and you deeply. You are both very important to me. And so Mark tells his father to listen to him for a moment, asking him not to try and conquer the planet. Nolan is of course visibly angry, but Mark goes through the whole story of what happened in his original life. Nolan doesn't believe his story and says he refuses to go against Viltrum as he attacks his son, just as he had before. However, this time, things are different. In this timeline, Nolan never had the chance to kill the Guardians of the Globe, so as their fight breaks out, Mark continues to lead his fathers to the Guardians' headquarters. And this time, it is Mark and the Guardians against Nolan, and Nolan loses. Cecil arrives and puts Nolan in a special prison, and while locked up, Mark goes to apologize to him, but just as he had before, Nolan recognizes that he really didn't want to hurt Mark. He's ashamed for having hurt his son and says that Mark was right, but hearing the truth made him angry, adding that if it weren't for you, I would have done horrible things. I would have killed the Guardians of the Globe. Some of them were my friends. I had even thought about how I would have to do it fast before I realized what I was doing because I didn't want to stop myself. Here, Nolan even thanks Mark for having opened his eyes and showing him just how much he has been changed by Earth. When Alan arrives shortly after, Mark tells him the whole story as well and brings him to meet with his father so that they can start moving forward to deal with the Viltrumites and to show that Nolan is no longer a threat to the coalition. Together, Nolan and Alan head towards Telescria after a very heartfelt reunion with Debbie, now that Nolan knows just how much he really means to him. And that's the last we see of Nolan in the reboot before Mark unreboots the universe. In doing so, though, uh, Mark returns to his own timeline after five years have passed. When we first get a look at what's happening with Nolan in the future, his mustache has grown even more regal and powerful, but he is teaming up with Robot and several other heroes to stop the invading forces of Technians. He is teaming up with Robot and several other heroes to stop the invading 
forces of the technicians. By this point, not only do Robot and Nolan have a truce, but Nolan even considers him a friend. Of note though, is that at the end of the battle, Robot pushes Nolan to execute the leader of their enemies. However, it seems that Robot's influence over Nolan has found middle path between pure pacifism and pure wrath. When Mark returns home, they get into it a little about his father still working with Robot, but things are cut off when another Viltrumite named Anissa arrives. While Nolan is aware of a tension between her and Mark, he doesn't know the whole story, which is why Nolan is so confused when Eve attacks her on sight for um doing what she did to Mark. <laughs> Let's keep it at that. Once she is removed, Mark and Nolan continue their discussion about Robot and Nolan really comes to bat for him as he talks about all the good he has been able to do. In the five years that Mark was away, Robot has basically built a utopia on Earth. Things started on bad footing, but you can't argue with the results. Mark, though, has a difficult time coming to terms with accepting the way Robot was doing things and decides that he and his family once again need to leave. This time being set up on a planet that they can live alone on by Alan. At least that was the plan. Alan had also been using Oliver as a double agent who was faking a partnership with Thrag and to prove his loyalty, he had to give Thrag Mark's location. Thrag then invades with two purple children and attacks Eve, Mark, and their daughter Tara. Oliver would show up too late to help and Thrag kills him almost immediately before also leaving both Eve and Mark on death's door, saying that Tara will be left alone to starve surrounded by the corpses of her parents. Luckily though, when Eve dies, her power kick in and she's able to rebuild both Mark and her own bodies into even stronger versions of themselves, allowing them to survive without Thrag knowing. Now, we gotta talk about the purple kids. Having learned about Oliver and more specifically about Nolan's time on the bug planet Thraxa, Thrag made a plan. After being exiled, he made his way to Thraxa and took control of it and then he started sleeping with every bug woman he could find until he had an army of purple Viltrumite bug babies. Bugussy going crazy crazy on this show. But most of them were now in their early to mid teens. Not as strong as adult Viltrumites by any means, but when there are hundreds or possibly thousands of them, that doesn't really matter. With Thrag now being a real threat again and starting to make his moves, the decision is made to do something about him. Alan and Mark try to convince Nolan to mobilize the Viltrumites to stop him, but at first he refuses. Mark goes off on him though and tells him that Thrag's army needs to be liberated from the tyrant they are living under, but more importantly, Nolan has a responsibility to stop Thrag as he was the one who allowed him to go free in the first place. And Nolan shouts that he knows before becoming very sad, walking away and saying he knows that everything is his fault again, including Oliver's death. He says that he can't command his people to fight, but he can at least ask. The coalition, Nolan included, then leads a raid against Thrag where he throws countless of his own children at the invaders. Completely completely unbothered by how many of them die in the process as long as the enemies go with them. One of his daughters, Urso, takes issue with the pointless sacrifices of her siblings and confronts her father about it. Thrag basically tells her that if her siblings die, that just means they were weak and that these deaths will temper their empire to make it stronger than ever. After a day of non-stop bloodshed, the coalition pulls out to space, where Thrag and his army follow them all the way back to Earth. We then learned that Nolan was right and that all the Viltrumites living on Earth had begun to love their families and experience the same changes that he did. Not only that, but they care so much about their new lives that they are willing to fight to protect it, setting up an ambush for Thrag close to the sun. On the journey back, Nolan and Mark talk about the changing Viltrumites and Nolan says that some of them seem almost completely different, which leads Mark to ask about Anissa. Given the weirdness between her and Mark, as well as the anger that Eve showed towards her, Nolan puts things together that Anissa forced herself on Mark at some point. Mark explains he didn't tell his father because he didn't want him to kill her when every Viltrumite is important. Nolan is angry but empathetic towards her as that was the Viltrumite way. He can both recognize how terrible what she did to Mark was but also he himself was doing terrible things before Earth.
earth changed him. To condemn Anissa and not recognize her growth would be hypocritical towards his beliefs now, and it's a moment that both he and Mark struggle very much with. Eventually, Thrag and his fleet catch up to the coalition, causing another battle to break out near the sun, and as Nolan was the one who let Thrag go, he takes the responsibility of fighting him on his own. And this goes as about as well as last time. Nolan blocks one of Thrag's punches and his forearm snaps in half. He punches Thrag in the head only for his hand to crumple on impact. There's nothing he can do to hurt Thrag, so Mark steps in to help. Even together though, they aren't enough, and Thrag shoves his arm through Nolan's torso before basically splitting him in half and leaving most of his upper body missing. Even with Nolan down for the count, the fight continues as Mark grabs Thrag and flies him into the center of the sun, holding him there until Thrag is disintegrated. Mark only survives because Robot arrives to help him at the last moment and get him out of there. As for the rest of Thrag's army, Ursul commands her siblings to stop fighting, as their father didn't care about them and so they should no longer die for him, something which allows Alan to see that Nolan was right about Viltrumite's capacity to change, as he offers forgiveness to the surrendering army. But that leads us back to Nolan. When Mark wakes up, he goes to check on his father and finds that he's barely holding on to life and only being supported by a large machine in his chest. Nolan explains that Thrag damaged his heart too much for him to recover and as Mark begs him not to die, he tells his son that he has to be strong and that their people need him. Mark will need to assume the throne and lead Viltrum when Nolan dies, but Mark hates this idea. He just lost five years with his family and he isn't ready to give up on the rest of his life on top of that. But Nolan pushes back. He asks his son where he will go that will make him feel safe and what will he be doing while he hides from his responsibilities. Nolan wants Mark to think about how much of a better world he could build for his daughter if he were the one to lead the Viltrumites. Nolan says that they need a leader, but more specifically, it has to be Mark. He thinks back on who he was and who he could become again and admits that Nolan changed so much because of Mark and hopes that the rest of his people will do the same. Nolan argues that like the rest of his people, he was born on Viltrum and brought up in their barbaric ways, but Mark is free from that mentality and was born loving peace. Because of that, he is the only one who can show them the way forward. With his last words, Nolan tells his son that his compassion had changed him and asks him to do the same for the rest of his people as well. And with that, Earth's strongest hero, Omni-Man, passes away in his son's arms as he wishes for the lie he told Mark as a child to come true. A universal utopia guided by Viltramites. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to click on the video displayed to you on screen right now because that's another banger.